former Deputy Prime Minister. Hello to you, my Lord. Thank you for joining us. What do you think should happen? Should Boris well, Johnson I'm, I'm, be allowed I'm, I'm, to stay? I'm absolutely clear that uh, uh, we need a Deputy Prime Minister to, to act in the interregnum before the new Prime Minister is chosen. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, Boris Johnson, if he actually were allowed to stay, uh, is going to try and put through a range of policies which will bolster his position, presumably for another go or something like that. Um, so th th that's unthinkable. Uh, we're now dealing with a very short period in which a new leader is chosen and there will have to be a pause in serious policy initiatives. But the, the critical thing, of course, here is that Boris is associated with one major policy uh, and that is it, and that is Brexit. And I coined the phrase, if Boris goes, Brexit goes. Uh, to me, the, the big and interesting dilemma is the way in which Keir Starmer has been wrong-footed in making these anti-European speeches, as he has, to, on the basis that he was going to fight Boris Johnson. Now, of course, the Tory party is going to have to find a new leader. And uh, my belief is that there will be a, a, a return to sanity towards our policies about Europe. Uh, which will make uh, Keir Starmer look, I think, rather foolish and irrelevant. Uh, but certainly Boris has got to go and he mustn't be allowed to sort of manoeuvre and manipulate power in the dying days of his premiership. But, my Lord, you know that the Conservative Party, the modern Conservative Party, wanted to get Brexit done. That's why Jeremy Hunt failed uh, when he was in the two-horse race with Boris Johnson. 66% of those who voted, Conservative members around the country, said they wanted Boris Johnson. And the big issue then, as it is now, was Brexit. So any... Uh, potential Prime Minister who comes forward will not say they want to go back into Europe? Well, uh, they won't say that, but they will, I think, say they want a totally more positive relationship with Europe. Um, and if they don't, then they're going to build the opening for the Lib Dems in the south of England. Uh, you see, people quote what happened in the last general election. That's history. The important thing is what is happening in the by-elections and in public opinion. And public opinion has now sees Brexit as a disaster and the Lib Dems are winning safe seats from the Conservatives in the south of England on the issue of Europe, amongst other things. So if the Tory party is going to have a ghost of a chance of going through the next few months, which are going to be very difficult economically, and then being a credible party in the next election, they're going to have to revert to that traditional conservative position of building a power base in the centre of British politics. Now, don't tell me the party has got divisions on this subject. I fully understand that. But the, the extreme anti-Europeanism, right-wingism, is in fact a suicide course for the Tory party in the context of the economic circumstances we're facing. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question for those who haven't heard me ask it before. Who do you think would best fit that role? Well, look, I'm fully aware that I'm quite a controversial figure in the Tory party. So my endorsement could be toxic and therefore I will remain like a clam, silent. <laughs> uh, if I were to press you, might you um, indulge me? Might I what? Might you indulge me with a name if I were to press you and ask you again? Even faced with your charm, I will remain clam-like. <laughs> Do you think there is enough time between now and recess, which is when uh, all the MPs go on their summer holidays, to try to narrow down the... I mean, it's going to be a wide-open race, isn't it, for those that would like to uh, be the incumbent at number 10. Do you think there is enough time for Conservative MPs to narrow that down, whittle that down to two? Oh, yes, if they want to. And the, 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 the fact is they will do it very rapidly. Uh, they're, they're going on their holidays. They want, don't want this hanging all over the constituencies in that time. Uh, the thing, of course, the trouble is, and I personally would change this rule, uh, I think that the idea of putting two people to the membership of the Tory party is actually a, 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 a mistake because the, the membership of the Tory party is 
a relatively small part of the Tory vote, and it tends to be rather activist, it tends to be rather extreme. And uh, so there is an inbuilt instinct to go for the populist arguments that appeal to the Tory activists as opposed to the critical electorate, which is the one in the centre ground of British politics. OK, we are going to hear from the Prime Minister uh, to confirm what we already know, that he will be resigning today. What do you think? What do you want to hear from him? Goodbye. Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit more than that, potentially. Well, it's very difficult to know what he can say. I mean, he has been a disastrous Prime Minister in the conduct of the nation's affairs. I'm fully aware that he did a perfectly reasonable job over COVID, broadly the same as all our European equivalents. Uh, I know he's uh, been uh, supportive of the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, heroic defence, and I, of course, much support that. But any prime minister would have done the same. And um, there is that awful feeling reflected in Max Hastings' article in The Times today, the Boris saw it as an opportunity of, you know, boosterism, bolsterism. I'm a Churchill, mini Churchill, not even a mini Churchill. Um, so I'm afraid the cynics, uh, uh, cynicism in me, it tells me that really when it comes to it, what has Boris achieved? And Boris has achieved the trashing of Britain's international reputation, the trashing of the reputation of the Tory party, and left us facing an economy in very serious trouble about which the truth needs to be told. And with the devolution agenda, which has been much talked about, uh, actually moving at a snail's pace. You are, um, I think we're both, um, uh, I was going to say of a certain age, I'm going to say experienced, and we've seen a few of these situations previously. Um, can you make any comparisons between this end of days and other Tory MPs who've had to go? I think that uh, there is one stark comparison, and that is dignity. Or well, in this case, the that. Well, I mean, the, the fact, I mean, it is now a significant period since Michael Howard and William Hague, as former leaders of the party, said that the prime minister had to go. We saw that 148 of his colleagues vote against him, and there, of course, were many more who would have done so in any second round. Um, and, and there has been this sort of unedifying clinging to the rock against the inevitable prizing off. And it has been a very undignified process, um, and I can't think of any precedent from all the leadership battles that I've watched on the touchlines of now nearly 50 years in public life uh, as unedifying as this one. And, my Lord, what would you say to uh, comments that I've been reading in the papers this morning that suggested that if a big beast like you had still been in politics today, he would not have turned you away last night and said, I'm still staying? Uh, in other words, it's those around him, not just the Prime Minister, for now, that is responsible for this unedifying spectacle? Uh, I think that his colleagues should have um, acted more decisively and earlier. Um, but I'm afraid that uh, I subscribe to the view that uh, the Cabinet is basically Boris's friends. Uh, we have not okay. got that traditional position of, the, of a good cabinet, which represents the wide spectrum of Tory party thinking.